you know, people uh, that, that we can work on changing. Uh, so I don't yeah. despair. I mean, every marketing expert I've ever interviewed said, forget it, cooking's dead, give it up. But I'm not prepared to go there. Well, maybe we can make cooking sexy. Well, we are making cookies, cooking sexy. It's all over television. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we have celebrity chefs in this country. Um, that's a very bizarre situation. I mean, in the history of culture, right? I mean, and um, that they're mass market uh, celebrities. So that tells me there's an opportunity to glamorize cooking. Um, we're glamorizing farming right now. I mean, you have lots of people in their 20s, um, and I worry for all of them, want to you know, get into farming. It's, it's, oh. it's a dream. They're, they're farming their backyard. I mean, you know, well, it was on that's the front, front cover of New York Magazine about four months ago. You know, this guy turned his, uh, you know, his, his backyard into his garden, and, you know, if it doesn't come out of his own garden, he ain't eating it. So speaking of gardens, the White House has one. Do you think Michelle Obama's been effective with uh, bringing gardening and children and food programs together, we do uh, uh, deals like hers with Walmart and this real discussion about changing food, is that helpful? I think it's very helpful. I think she's, she's making a really important contribution. I mean, she's got people talking about these issues. She's brought this question to a whole audience that, that um, you know, people on this panel haven't reached. And um, so I think it's been really good. Uh, I think that, you know, she has been drawn down that path of negotiating with food manufacturers. And she's, I, and this was inevitable and this was bound to happen. And I, and, but that, you know, you get into a negotiation over slightly better junk food. And, and a lot of energy is now going into that. And I don't think that that's, that's time well spent. Yeah, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna differ with you there. The Let's Move campaign, as it's you know currently uh, constituted, and you can read about it in Newsweek, right up there. You know, feed your children well. Focus on the individual. Focus on the family. Focus on the community. <coughs> all necessary, but not sufficient, because there's no focus on the food industry and no focus on the government. Now, why is that? Very simple. They don't need any more enemies. They got enough. Okay, that's a fight they don't want to fight. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, what she says is absolutely reasonable. And to be honest with you, I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. We had an audience with Michelle Obama's um, uh, head of the Obesity Task Force. His name is Dr. Bashara Kusher, and he's the head of the Chicago Department of Public Health. And we explained all of the issues around sugar. A dentist who, you know, I mean, they should be, you know, the, the biggest sugar cessation advocates and us, and he heard the whole story, and his answer was, not interested, not interested. So you tell me, if Andy says it's a toxin, and I say it's a chronic dose-dependent hepatotoxin, and the dentist certainly have known it's a toxin forever, and he says, not interested. So we got a lot of work to do. Well, we definitely have a lot of work to do. I think that it's a lot to ask of a first lady to attack a major industry and I mean, you know. <laughs> but, but in terms of, but what has to happen, see we need to, we need to create a movement. We need to create a movement that will counter the power of the sugar industry. Yeah, and that's true and with any, anything. It's the same thing with healthcare in general. There's no possibility of change coming from the government. Uh, there's no possibility of change coming from our elected representatives. The only change possible is if there is a grassroots movement in which enough people become informed about this, angry enough, and demand change and change the political balance of power. That's the only way it'll happen. You could all be part of that. Absolutely. In, Absolutely. In, in every area, that, whether it's, it's any public policy area I've worked in, whether it's uh, privacy or food or security or health care, the government is a lagging indicator. Yeah, absolutely. Therefore, it is part of this issue. So Andy, you've been really successful in helping change health care education, uh, the way people approach food, the way they approach their lives. How do you think we should take on this issue with sugar and other things? Well, you know, in the, in the sphere in which I work, which, which is education of health care professionals and education of the public, I've tried to do what I can to stimulate 
that sort of movement. Uh, it, is, it is upsetting to me that healthcare professionals and physicians in particular have been so lame in the political arena. Um, they really have been apathetic and inept in working for political and social change. And yet they have a tremendous potential to do so because people look up to physicians. You know, they are the shamans of modern industrial technological society. And, uh, you know, if they could get their act together, they could spearhead this kind of grassroots movement. Uh, so I'd love to see that happen, both in the law, in, with health care reform in general, and particularly on these nutritional issues. Uh, they could be a great focal point for getting this grassroots movement going. Well, I'm, I'm going to differ with you there, yeah. too. Not because the doctors shouldn't be involved. They absolutely should be involved. But because government has a problem. You know, they're basically playing both sides of the street. You know, here's Obamacare, whether it gets enacted or not is not the issue. You know, basically saying we're going to put 32 million more sick people on the rolls and we're going to pay for it because we're going to now have them get preventative services. What a joke. I mean, think about it. You're going to be able to get preventative services to prevent your heart attack after you've consumed your 64 gallons of Coca-Cola? I mean, they want it both ways, and it's not going to happen both ways. So, you know, they, they can't do it. They cannot do it the way it's currently constituted. And the problem is, as you've all rightly said, government doesn't want this fight, and certainly Michelle Obama doesn't want this fight. So how do you change a politician's viewpoint? Very simple. One word. Okay? Four-letter word. Vote. Right? Okay. If they think votes are at stake, they're not going to be able to get the, you know, I mean, they, if they get voted out, they're not going to be able to take any more money. So, you know, it's all about, I mean, can you vote them, you know, can you basically supply enough votes to counteract the money coming from the other side? Now, my whole reason for labeling sugar a toxin, and I didn't, by the way, I didn't make that New York Times Magazine article happen. You know, I'm not even quoted in that New York Times Magazine article. That, you know, I found out about that article a week before when the uh, fact checker for the New York Times called me up and said, you know, you're, you're a main source for this story. Can you check on this? I went, what are you talking about? You know, so the bottom line is, um, you know, th that helped in a lot of ways. Even, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an unwilling participant, if you will, unwilling <laughs> combatant. But uh, it, the reason why it's important to label sugar toxic is because it gives government cover for being able to do something about it. But it sounds like, Yandy, you're suggesting that the, the medical professionals can use organizing, use technology. Yeah. If, if they can organize uh, using Facebook to overthrow governments in the Middle East, the doctors can help organize to take on some of the issues around nutrition and food and these Absolutely. other bill issues. Absolutely. And I think if there were an organized movement of doctors campaigning against sugar, for example, uh, I think that could spearhead this kind of change. Well, I think maybe you guys should take that up at the conference tomorrow. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of other topics that have been hitting the news that I want to make sure we cover in our, in our speed, you know, rapid fire round here. We're going to take some questions from the audience as well. Uh, so start to organize your questions uh, in about 10 minutes or so. We're going to open up the, the mics on the side and take some audience questions. But uh, let's, let's take on a few things. Gluten-free. They just delivered a giant gluten-free cake to the White House because there's a gluten-free craze and we haven't defined it well. What's your take? Well, this is a mystery to me. You know, the, I think we don't know the answers to this. Gluten uh, sensitivity, this tremendous explosion of it that we've seen, uh, it ha some of it is faddish, some of it may be unreal, but certainly there is a, a core that's medically significant. Uh, wheat has been a staple of human civilizations for thousands of years. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, I mentioned at the conference that I was in China last fall where gluten is commonly eaten as a protein, uh, pure gluten. It's sautéed and you get sweet and sour gluten. Uh, I asked about gluten sensitivity. It was unheard of in China. Uh, very interesting. So why is it happening here? I've heard various theories about that. One is that we've bred strains of wheat with higher and higher gluten content, so people may be getting more of it than they ever got. Uh, Michael talked to me about the possibility of fermentation being an issue here, because uh, traditionally uh, bread dough was long fermented, and the fermentation process may have broken down gluten in some way that made it more digestible. 
Uh, but I don't think we know the answer to this. We definitely don't know the answer, uh, but there's a medical clue that might you know, some, shed some light. Because celiac disease or you know, gluten intolerance also co-migrates with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. And we know that type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. We know that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. There's now data that says that cow's milk protein introduced too early may be one of the precipitating factors. So if you have a leaky gut and you allow the, uh, these proteins undigested to get across, you're going to cause um, uh, T-cell and antibody formation, which can then drive disease further down. So the question is, what makes the leaky gut? The answer, the, sh the, the, the long answer is, I don't know for sure, but the, sh the short answer is, alcohol certainly does it, but we're not giving alcohol to our babies. But guess what else does it? Fructose. <laughs> Serious. I'm not kidding. Bruce Ames over at Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute and his colleague Mark Shiganaga have shown this. It's, so maybe that's driving It's also driving this. cow's milk protein in genetically susceptible people may also cause damage to gut cells that causes this kind of leaking. You know, other, other proteins that we may introduce too early may do this. And, and they, they have also found that when gluten was introduced early, it was being used in some baby formulas in Europe. They had a big outbreak of celiac from that population. But I don't think it's additional gluten in the diet because if you go back to 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century Europe, people were getting 50% of their calories from bread. And, you know, we're, not, we're getting nowhere near that. Right. Um, so I, that, it, it is more likely to be something having to do with the immune system in general. Um, and w the, the, the fermentation, you know, we are using gluten in a slightly different way. I mean, the, the way you raised bread was a very long fermentation, which generally makes the food much more digestible and slower to absorb. Um, and now we raise bread very quickly, and um, so, but I don't know that that's, yeah. that's crucial or not. So uh, on our, our short list, uh, those of us in California, radiation in the food, should we be eating seaweed? Iodine, is it coming towards us? How do we think about this? Uh, it is coming towards us. There have been detectable levels of radiation in dairy products here in California. Uh, I would advise getting seaweed, which by the way is radiation protective, uh, from Maine rather than from Japan. <laughs> and there are many sources of it. With regard to fish, I just saw a bulletin today from the Alaska Seafood Institute, uh, which showed that the ocean currents coming from Japan are going w well south of Alaska. I mean, that's not good news for California. But it's not affecting Alaska seafood. Uh, the two main products, the radiation products that we should be concerned about, radioactive iodine has a very short half-life. The, the one that's of greater concern is radioactive cesium. Uh, but the information that I've seen is that fish excrete this and don't accumulate it. So I would say, uh, you know, I, I probably would be cautious about eating fish known to come from Japan. I guess the advice is to find out where your fish come from. So the other, one of the other uh, major crazes of the moment is a combination of probiotics meets kombucha. <laughs> so um, we, I know from the conference there are many advocates of probiotics. We might want to talk about that a little bit for the public. And then a lot of people are saying, well, get your fermentation probiotic from kombucha. So, you know. Uh, probiotics are great. And these are the friendly bacteria, um, lactobacillus acidophilus. They occur in cultured foods, naturally yogurt, uh, fresh pickles, sauerkraut. Um, they colonize the gut. It is good to have populations of them in there. You can buy probiotic supplements in liquid or dry form. I've long recommended them and continue to do very strongly that anybody taking antibiotic therapy should take probiotics for the entire course of antibiotic therapy. They're useful for people traveling to areas of the world where travelers' diarrhea uh, are common. But recently there have been um, a lot of documented uh, beneficial effects of probiotics in conditions like autism in ADHD, where you wouldn't expect probiotics to have a useful effect. And this may have to do with correcting leaky gut <coughs> syndrome, where these uh, proteins that shouldn't get into the general circulation cause immune reactions that might affect things in the brain. Anyway, probiotics are good. My preference is to get them from living foods. Uh, I make my own sauerkraut. I make my own pickles. I love Asian fermented foods. 
Uh, Asians by the East Asians eat these at every meal and consider these to be very beneficial to digestion and health. Uh, fermentation is a great thing. It, 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 it is, you're letting microorganisms doing a lot of the digestive work for you. And this makes it easier for your body to assimilate things and the organisms may produce beneficial products on their own. Um, uh, kombucha is a special case. This is a much hyped uh, product. It's a mixed culture of bacteria and yeasts. Uh, people used to do this at home. You brew up tea and put a lot of sugar in it and you get a, a piece of a culture and put it on this and it forms a kind of membrane on the surface and the liquid gets sour uh, and this is supposed to be a healthful drink. Uh, it can become contaminated with dangerous <laughs> organisms and I am not a big fan of it. It's been remarkable to watch the way this has been so successfully hyped and sold as a commercial product. If people like it, you know, they, they're welcome to drink it. I think there's better tasting probiotic products and fermentation products. I make my kids eat dirt. <laughs> <laughs> a good thing, but by the way, there is a, there is a recent, uh, you know, you said I, I, I wrote this book on depression and happiness, and one of the interesting papers I came across is that having your hands in dirt has an antidepressant effect. Uh, and it's not only having your hands in dirt, but inhaling dust from soil. And it's been found to be associated with a particular microorganism that seems to produce an antidepressant effect in humans. So a Andy, in your, speaking of that, um, in your book, you were talking about diet and happiness and yes. some new findings. Okay, interesting. I'll try to summarize this very quickly. We're in the midst of a, an unprecedented epidemic of depression. Uh, one in ten Americans is now taking antidepressant medication. Numbers going up. Um, depression is unknown in hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, it is a phenomenon of modern life. It correlates with affluence. You know, what's changed? What, what's different? How are we different from hunter-gatherers that accounts for this? Well, obviously, there are many things that are different. We don't exercise as much. Uh, we're disconnected from nature. There's increasing social isolation. We're subjected to information overload. And our diets have changed drastically. Uh, so I, one of the questions I was interested in was to what extent may diet be influencing this? And I came across a, a body of literature that I was unfamiliar with, and it's, it struck me as a very interesting story. Uh, first of all, let me just say that the whole serotonin hypothesis of de depression, on which all of these pharmaceutical drugs are based, looks very shaky to me. You know, I think it's a big house of cards that rests on nothing. There is a, a drug currently being marketed in the UK that's an effective antidepressant that lowers brain serotonin levels. You know, you can't have it both ways. And there's also an increasing body of evidence that the, the SSRI antidepressants, Zoloft, uh, Prozac, and so forth, work no better than placebos, even in severe depression. I mean, this is shocking news. All right, there's an alternative hypothesis of depression that I came across that, that fascinated me. Farmers have long known that when domestic animals get sick, usually with infections, they exhibit a characteristic pattern of behavioral changes that are, that's called sickness behavior. And this is characterized by immobility, loss of appetite, loss of sexual behavior, loss of interest in interacting with others of their kind. And this has been attributed traditionally to fatigue caused by the illness. But in the 1950s, it was found that sickness behavior was was tr mediated by a blood-borne factor. You can take blood from an animal with this behavior, inject it into a healthy animal, it shows the same behavioral changes. It was called factor X. Nobody knew what it was. It was not until the 1970s, late 1970s, that it was identified as cytokines, yeah, which, are, which are the group of immune modulating substances. Interestingly, some of these cytokines have been purified and made available as medical treatments, interferon for chronic hepatitis C, for example, and the side effects of these are severe depression. In fact, interferon has been associated with suicide, and this is listed on the package insert of it. So the conclusion is that disturbances of immunity correlate with disturbances uh, with depression. And, you know, again, it's hard to say which is chicken and which is egg here, but it could well be, and this has led to what's called the cytokine hypothesis of depression, that depression is another manifestation of a pro-inflammatory state. And this would explain w where the dietary change might play a role in what we're seeing in this culture that I've said that the mainstream American diet is strongly pro-inflammatory, and that may be affecting mental emotional health by this cytokine mechanism. Well, let me give you another possibility. Everybody remember the drug Romanabant? Never got approved here in the United States. Was approved in, in, uh, yep. in Europe. 
So this was an anti-obesity drug that caused you to reduce your food intake and cause weight loss, except for one little problem. 20% of patients became clinically depressed and several committed suicide. So when you block cannabinoid receptors, you get depressed. So that's not serotonin, right. but it's definitely brain chemicals in the reward system. Right. Bottom line is, we all have our addiction. Rich people have power, money, gambling. Middle class people have cocaine, amphetamine, nicotine, cannabis, ethanol, caffeine, right? George Carlin called it Caucasian crack, right? And you know, the dirt poor, they got sugar. That's all they got. And Sugar seems to go up and down. It sure does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's here a lot. But the bottom line is, if, you, if, you're, not ga if you're not gaining enough reward, you're going to manifest signs of depression. And there are lots of reasons why that reward system shuts down, including cortisol, including chronic stress, including um, you know, ch changes in brain biochemistry, which you know, I don't think that they're necessarily dissociated you know, no. what you're talking about. I think they're the same. So Andy, based on the findings, what do you have in the book that talks about how you might uh, eat or behave differently to change that? If that's well, clear, first of all, clearly, we have the, the, the two interventions for which we have the strongest evidence are exercise and omega-3 fatty <coughs> acids. Uh, and omega-3 fatty acids may work by many mechanisms on brain chemistry, one of which could be an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, but I would think that in terms of diet, it's the same advice. You know, almost any question you ask, it's to stop eating refined, processed, and manufactured food. You know, in this case, this favors inflammation, upregulation of cytokines, which directly produce depression. So I'm going to ask the audience members if you guys have any questions. There are mics on the right and the left, and we will take a few. Um, we have about... Uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. So we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, if you can make them brief, um, if it can be a question, not a statement, that would be helpful. And also remember this is the public forum. So um, if the questions can be more to the general public as opposed to those of you who are health professionals in the room who have the conference for those things. Thanks. Over here. Well, I was standing at the microphone by the time you said it, it should be a question, not a statement. <laughs> so I'll make it short. Um, I'm uh, working on the GMO issue. And there's an interesting model in terms of changing um, the market through increasing awareness. In Europe, a high-profile food safety scandal that erupted when a gag order was lifted on a scientist in February 16, 1999, caused 750 articles to be written about the dangers of GMOs, and 10 weeks later, the tipping point of consumer rejection was achieved, and within a single week, virtually every major food company committed to stop using GM ingredients. In the United States, it was described as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year, where most Americans don't realize they eat genetically modified foods. So we've been educating consumers by the millions now, expecting to create a tipping point of consumer rejection, which we think is around 5% of US shoppers avoiding GM ingredients because genetically modified foods offer no consumer benefits. So we think that it's a very easy transformation. So I offer that there was a discussion about how to bring education in terms of transformation. With GMOs, it may be easier because there's no consumer benefits. And I just wanted to put that out because we saw a similar thing with bovine growth hormone and its demise recently as a tipping point there as well. Thank you. Um, any comments on GMOs? I, I might add that though there, is, uh, there are products coming that will purport to offer consumer benefits. And the, the most significant one to watch is, uh, is the omega-3 enhanced soy. Um, and that may give the industry the first, uh, you know, the first health claim on a GM uh, crop. And, and that may change the politics, um, but uh, hard to say. I don't know. I, I, Andy yesterday spent a lot of time on the concept of functional foods. Okay, I'm not sure that any of this is you know, uh, particularly good for us. Over here. Hi, I'm Gretchen Dubow. I'm the executive director for the Alliance for Natural Health. We are a politically active nonprofit. We basically protect access to natural health options, and we're well known for being able to deliver a couple hundred thousand comments to Congress on important issues. 
So I have an offering of partnership and a question for the three of you. Would you be interested in working with us on some of the issues that we talked about here tonight? And in particular, I'm thinking sugar. Absolutely. If you've, if you've got access, I'm interested. You know. We yeah. do. Well, that sounds like we got a deal made. Excellent. <laughs> Well, well, welcome to Silicon Valley for that. Um, over here. Hi, my question is about trans fats. Um, so many times we hear and read that, that trans fats no longer are part of our food system, but yet so many processed foods, I'm picking up the label and even though it says zero yeah. grams of trans fat, there's partially hydrogenated oils. And my concern is with kids and, and you know, is, should I be concerned or, um, Yes, or, you should not uh, eat anything that's got partially hydrogenated anything in it. Right. That's as simple. I, as, I think as I said in my talk yesterday, the, the trans double bond cannot be broken by, by a bacteria. That's why they were added to foods and originally is for shelf life because the, because the bacteria can't digest them. Well, guess what? Our mitochondria are refurbished bacteria. They even have their own DNA. Bottom line, we can't digest them either. No, wait, by the way, you asked me last night, Rob, about natural trans yeah. fats, which I referred to. There are natural trans fats that are produced in the stomachs of ruminant animals, cows, goats, sheep. And these find their way into milk and possibly in the meat. And interestingly, these trans fats don't seem to have the adverse health effects of artificial trans fats. And it would be interesting to know why. So we get some natural trans fats in butter, in milk, in cheese, and that doesn't seem to do us any harm. But the ones created in laboratories are very unhealthy. Over here. You asked a question a little bit ago about what we have to do to create a movement for sugar. And I can only offer to you the Wisconsin experience. If any of you have kept track of what's happened in Wisconsin over the last few months, it has nothing to do with sugar, but it has to do with a movement. <laughs> a movement. Has to do with unions. <laughs> well, that's, there, that's an it, easy way to say is, it. Is there a question? Um, yeah, no. I, <laughs> Frankly, no. We, but I just uh, want to—I want to share this because I think it, it came we, home we, to me we, this we morning. We really like to limit it to questions. I understand. Just, uh, thank well, you. I think the question was posed, and I would like to answer. And that—and that is that <laughs> one of the things that happened in Wisconsin is that. The only reason you heard about physicians in Wisconsin is because they, they did excuses for people who are protesters, and that got around, and those people who wrote excuses saying that these protesters were sick had to then um, go before their medical boards, and that they're still awaiting what will happen to them. But the thing that we've learned is that you have to take someone away from, something away from us. You know, um, when you say we're going to take sugar away from you, people don't want that. But if you can find something else to take away from them, what would that be? If you could take something away from people, rather than saying we're going to take sugar away from you, say something else. We're going to take something away from you, and then they'll pull it back. If you want to take sugar away, they'll pull it back. What can you do? Thank you. Hi, I'm Denise Milstein. I'm a physician from Phoenix and a fellow with the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. All of us are so excited here and want to go home and bring this message back. But one fear I have yet to hear addressed is the fear of these large industries. Um, when you say something or you make a claim, whether it be litigation or pushback from them, and I wonder if you could just give us some general guidelines how to walk that line when we're writing to our local newspapers and local magazines, et cetera. So this is the, the Oprah beef industry phenomenon. Well, the industry is very litigious, and they have uh, some surprising laws. Uh, veggie libel laws, um, which are on the books, I guess, in 13 states, and that if you say something that crashes the price of an agricultural commodity, you can be um, uh, held liable for slander. It's, it's easier to slander a broccoli than it is a, a person. Um, <laughs> These laws, uh, and this is what Oprah was sued on by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. She won, but it cost her more than a million dollars. But and she met Dr. Phil and made it back. <laughs> <laughs> but she was silent on the subject of food for about right. a decade. Well, um, well, all I can say is I've had that YouTube video out now for two years, and I'm still waiting for the lawsuit. Now, I, I think that these... I, and I have never had a problem either. I mean, I, I, know, I know journalists who have had problems. Um, a lot of it 
uh, depends on the industry you're attacking or whether you're attacking a company by name. But um, I, I just don't think it should um, impede us. Um, there, are, there are laws that are now being considered to ban the, taking pictures of feedlots, even from the road in Iowa and Florida, I think. Um, and these are outrageous, unconstitutional laws. They will not survive um, review. Um, and, and one of the, the strategies of the industry is to not, s generally not sue people who have the resources to take it to review, as Oprah would have done. It would have been a very good thing if she lost, actually, because we would have gotten a Supreme Court test and that would have been the end of